Lorentz model for dielectrics. In the previous lecture, we derived the Lorentz oscillator model. Here, we're going to talk about it and its consequences on the dielectric function. And there's a few interesting things that happen. We'll then look at the Lorentz model, talking about different wave parameters like refractive index and absorption coefficient, and we'll make a bunch of notes and observations. Okay, the Lorentz dielectric function, uh, epsilon that r, that's the relative permittivity, also called the dielectric constant. Since it's a function of frequency, we also call it the dielectric function. So our constitutive relation, is, we're gonna write this in a slightly different form when it includes the material polarization. So right now we have D equals epsilon naught E plus the material polarization. So the material polarization is really the response of the material. This is electric energy stored at the atomic scale in the form of the displaced charge. Remember, we stretch these electron clouds away from the nucleus. Well, there's a whole other way to store electric energy. That's in the field itself. And so that's the electric field E. So the electric flux D is really the all-inclusive electric field term that includes both ways to store electric energy in the field itself and in matter in the form of displaced charge. Well, remember the material polarization was epsilon naught times the electric susceptibility times the electric field. So we can replace this material polarization with the expression including susceptibility. Next step is, well, there's an epsilon naught in both terms. There's an electric field in both terms. We can factor that out. And we get in parentheses here a one plus our chi term, our electric susceptibility. So here's the equation we had on the previous slide. Uh, up to now, we've been writing that constitutive relation differently. We've just been writing it as D times an epsilon E. And here I'm writing it as the free space permittivity times the relative permittivity or the dielectric constant. And I'm putting a tilde over here to remind us that this is actually a complex number. Now what we're gonna do is compare these two equations. And so I'm gonna set the expression on the right here equal to the expression on the right above because they're both equaling D. So that's what we have here. And if we stare at this long enough, what we see is that this relative permittivity has to be one plus chi. So that's the big conclusion. So the electric susceptibility and the permittivity are almost the same thing. But we can think of the electric susceptibility, that's the response of matter to an electric field. The one is there because we also have the effect of the field itself. So we can store energy in the form of the field and that's why the one is there. But electric susceptibility and relative permittivity in my head are almost the same thing. We just have to remember to add the one in there. The susceptibility is exclusively what's happening with matter, whereas the permittivity includes the ability for matter and the field to store energy. Okay, so here's what we got in our previous video for the electric susceptibility. Now that we know that the dielectric function is just one plus that, well, we can derive an equation for the relative permittivity. So it's one plus our expression for the electric susceptibility. And so that's a big equation here. That's the dielectric function according to the Lorentz model, and that's for a single resonance. So that's the function we got from the previous slide. Uh, becomes very useful to look at the real and imaginary parts of epsilon. So how do we do that? Well, we have a complex number in the denominator, and anytime we multiply a complex number by its complex conjugate, we get a purely real number. So that's what we do. We look at the denominator here, and we figure out what the complex conjugate is, and it's really the same thing just with a positive sign here. And so we write that with the positive sign. And so we wanna multiply by one, so we take the same complex conjugate divided by the complex conjugate, so this ratio is one, but when we multiply it, we end up getting a purely real number in the denominator. Uh, here's the expression we get in the numerator. And now it's trivial to separate real and imaginary parts. And then from that, we can write the real and the imaginary parts of the permittivity. So the real part we indicate with a single prime and the imaginary part will indicate with a double prime. 
But if we were to add these together, we'd get the overall complex permittivity. So let's plot this. And we see something almost the same that we saw with the electric susceptibility. The difference is the real part has a one added to it. And so rather than plot magnitude and phase here, now we're plotting the real and imaginary parts of the permittivity. But we see a lot of our, our same conclusions that we saw before. So first, all the craziness, well, that's centered right at our resonant frequency of two. The width of our resonance is determined by that damping rate, the gamma term. If we look at the high frequency response, we can see that the real part of permittivity is approaching one and the imaginary part is approaching zero. And really what that's telling us is far above resonance, this resonance doesn't do anything. It's acting like a vacuum. It's, it's like it's not even there. Far below resonance, the imaginary part goes to zero again, but the real part has a DC offset above one. One would be uh, free space or air, but there's this DC offset. So the resonance far below the resonance has contributed a DC offset. And we can set omega equal to zero and derive a nice little expression for what that DC offset is. We can also derive nice equations for what the maximum value of the imaginary part is on resonance. And the real part on resonance is equal to one. And in fact, it passes through one on resonance. Now, also very interestingly, many times the resonance actually makes the real part of permittivity become negative in proximity to the resonance, but above the resonance. And that's very interesting that we can get a negative permittivity. Now we'll go on and we'll talk about wave parameters in terms of the Lorentz oscillator model. So first is the complex refractive index. So we will write the complex refractive index as a real and imaginary part. The real part we call the ordinary refractive index. And this is usually what people mean when they just say refractive index. But there actually is an imaginary part to that. This kappa term, Greek letter kappa, is called the extinction coefficient. And this is equal to the square root of the relative permeability times the relative permittivity. And resolving this sign is not trivial. And this gets into discussions of negative index materials, left-handedness and all that. The short story is we calculate this function and whatever the sign is of this function is how we assign the sign up here to that. Okay, for us, we're going to ignore the magnetic response for most frequencies of interest. The permeability is negligible. Uh, that tends to be, I don't really know where there's a permeability, a significant permeability much above a gigahertz. So for most applications, it's negligible. Most materials, it's negligible. And that's how we'll analyze things to simplify things here. So ignoring that the relative permeability, or not really ignoring it, but just setting it equal to one, we can now relate the complex refractive index directly to the complex permittivity. So n squared is our epsilon. And so we can write the real and imaginary part of refractive index squared, and that equals the real and imaginary part of permittivity. So we would like to derive expressions of how to calculate one system from the other. So very briefly, here's how that derivation would go. The first thing we're gonna do is expand our equation. So we really take this real and imaginary complex refractive index squared, set it equal to this, so we square it. So we actually go ahead and square the left-hand side and we get this expression on the left. Then from there, we collect real and imaginary parts on the right and the left. Now we're in a position to set the real part on the left equal to the real part on the right and the imaginary part on the left equal to the imaginary part on the right. And we come away with two equations that we, we have. Now we can substitute one of these into the other and solve for either n naught or, or kappa. So, but right away we have sort of an intermediate point where given the complex refractive index, we can calculate our complex permittivity. Well, let's keep going because we might want to calculate, given the permittivity, we might want to calculate the complex refractive index. So what we'll do is we'll solve this second equation for kappa. And then we'll substitute that expression into the first equation and we end up here. Well, we multiply that out and what we see is we actually have a quadratic equation for 
n naught squared. I shouldn't call it n naught. It's the ordinary refractive index squared. So we can use the quadratic equation to calculate the ordinary refractive index squared. And then we take the solution, take the square root of that finally to get n naught. So we have a nice expression to find n naught. And of course, we could repeat this whole thing. We could solve this uh, first equation for n naught instead of kappa. Kappa. We plug that in up here, multiply it out, solve it using the quadratic equation, and we end up with the second equation for kappa. So we have a set of equations now that we can calculate our complex refractive index from the complex permittivity. A lot of work for two simple equations. But remember, this is when we're ignoring the magnetic response. Okay, what about the attenuation constant? Well, let's think about an expression for a wave. We can describe a wave as some amplitude term and some oscillation term, e to the j, k, naught, n, z, where n is our complex refractive index. Let's go ahead and throw in what our complex refractive index is. It's the ordinary refractive index plus j kappa. Now what we can do is we can write this as the product of two exponentials. So we get an e to the minus k naught kappa z and an e to the j k naught and naught z. So this is clearly an oscillation term. So the ordinary refractive index is contributing to oscillations. This is clearly a decay term. And so kappa is responsible for decay or loss. Very often, when we just think about waves in general, we think of decay as an e to the minus alpha z. And this is our attenuation constant. And we'll think of oscillation as e to the j beta z, where beta is our phase constant. Well, we can compare these two exponentials to these two exponentials up here and actually calculate what they are. So alpha, the attenuation constant, is just k naught times kappa. And all of the loss really gets consolidated into this kappa term. And all of the, the phase, how quickly it oscillates and speed, gets absorbed into this ordinary refractive index term. Okay, now we have a way of calculating the complex refractive index from the complex permittivity. So we can plot the refractive index from the Lorentz oscillator model, and here's what we get. So I'm plotting actually three things here. I'm plotting not only the ordinary refractive index and the extinction coefficient, but I calculated the attenuation constant from the extinction coefficient, and we're plotting that as well. That's the black dashed line. That's the actual uh, attenuation constant. If we multiply it by two, it's called the absorption coefficient. So we see where all the craziness is happening again. That's centered on the resonant frequency of three. The width of the resonance is controlled by that gamma term. I chose a value of 0.3 here. If we look at the high frequency response, we can see that the ordinary refractive index is slowly trying to get to a refractive index of one. It hasn't reached it here yet, but it eventually will. And the kappa term is going to zero. So we do see, again, um, at the high frequency response, it's acting like a vacuum. But we can tell now it's taking a while to get there. On the low frequency side, the kappa term and the absorption coefficient go to zero. So the absorption goes to zero on both sides. So away from resonance, the absorption is rather low. And we see a DC offset here. And we can calculate what that DC offset is on the ordinary refractive index. Another very interesting thing, notice we're seeing a refractive index less than one. We're not only seeing a refractive index less than one, we're seeing a refractive index less than one over a considerable bandwidth. So here's an interesting thing. Above resonance, refractive index is often less than one. And we think of this as a magical thing, but you know what? Your teeth and bones have a refractive index less than one to x-rays because the resonances in your teeth and bones is below x-ray frequencies. So the x-rays are actually seeing a refractive index less than one in your teeth and bones. Here I just want to give you a practical example of the extinction coefficient and the refractive index, in this case of salt water. And not that we're going to conclude anything profound here, but what we want to point out is we are seeing these Lorentzian types of shapes. And so this is a very real thing. And this mass on a spring model is actually an extremely good model of what's happening at the atomic scale to electromagnetic waves.
Now we're going to make a bunch of different notes and observations about the Lorentz response of dielectrics. The first one is referred to TART. And really this is talking about how the material behaves to an electromagnetic wave. Is it transmissive, absorptive, reflective? And so what I've done is I've plotted up top here, maybe a bunch of lines and uh, maybe I shouldn't have plotted so many, but in blue, we're looking at the complex permittivity. In red, we're looking at the complex refractive index. And here's the Lorentz Drude parameters that I chose to plot. Now from that, I'm looking at reflection going air into this medium that has these Lorentz parameters. And so I'm calculating the reflection coefficient from the complex refractive index this way. From the reflection coefficient, I calculate my reflectance. That's the fraction of power reflected. And then I'm plotting that. And we wanna make a bunch of conclusions. And this is very typical of a resonance. Now below resonance, materials tend to be transmissive. They have this DC offset on the refractive index and permittivity, but the loss, the, the extinction coefficient is relatively low. So materials are transmissive here up to about the resonance frequency, but to be completely strict, it's the resonance frequency minus half of the gamma where gamma is the bandwidth. So a little bit below resonance and then all the way down to DC, materials are transmissive. Now, right on resonance, boy, there's a lot of crazy stuff. And we'll soon we'll talk about dispersion and how dispersions reverse and all kinds of really cool, interesting things that are happening here. However, what ruins it all is the loss. The loss is always high on resonances. And so materials tend to be very absorptive on resonances and it prevents us from exploiting these magical things that are happening. And that's not always true. And people are finding clever ways to still exploit some of the interesting things happening near resonance. But the absorption there is high and that's a real bummer because there's some cool stuff going on around resonances. So on resonance, it's absorptive. Above the resonance, up to a certain point, it's reflective. And we generally say this is up to about the plasma frequency, and it's not a real sharp cutoff, but um, you know, it's, it's not exactly not abrupt either, but materials are very reflective here. Then above that, materials become transmissive again. And in fact, it almost acts like free space, just vacuum. Uh, a little bit more accurately, we might say it's weakly absorbing up there, but mostly transmissive, and that's why X-rays can see through things, can see through walls and stuff like that. So remember TART. And, and that tells you how waves behave around a resonance. Now, if there's multiple resonances, uh, this is all mixed up and gets much more complicated. Our first observation is dispersion. If there's anything there, if the wave is interacting with anything, there always has to be dispersion. And by dispersion, I'm talking about the material properties changing as a function of frequency. So if we're going to have anything that possesses any kind of permittivity or refractive index, there also has to be dispersion. We can't get around that. The only thing we can try to do is design our devices and operate them where these, these places are flat. If assuming we want it flat, normally we do. Sometimes we don't. And so we want to operate in these flat regions. Typically it's below the resonance because we'll want the refractive index or we will want the permittivity there. Also notice that almost always we have positive dispersion and that's above and below resonance. Below resonance are the real part of permittivity is increasing, increasing, increasing. Above resonance, the real part of permittivity is increasing, increasing, increasing. So if we ever do material measurements, we can expect refractive index permittivity to be increasing with frequency. Now that changes a bit on resonance. Notice we have this negative dispersion. We'll also call it anomalous dispersion. Another crazy things happen here but we get this negative dispersion here and we get a huge jump. And uh, we'll point that out again later. So always have to have dispersion and it's almost always positive dispersion except on resonance. Observation number two, loss near resonance. So to really characterize loss, I've plotted the attenuation constant alpha here. So that's the red line. And I've also highlighted here where it's super high. And where it's super high is near and just above the resonance. So materials around the resonance are always very lossy. So around and just above the resonance. 
What about the loss far from residence? Well, below residence, it goes to zero pretty quickly. Above residence, it takes a little bit longer, but it also eventually goes to zero. So we can conclude if we're far enough away from a residence, losses are pretty low. So if we're trying to select a material and we don't want loss, we need to make sure that we're operating at a frequency or wavelength that's far from any of its atomic scale resonances. Bandwidth. Well, that damping rate, that gamma, that gamma term determines the bandwidth of a resonance. So if we're trying to exploit some kind of weird phenomenon that's happening around resonance, and we want to make that more broadband, we have to make gamma bigger. Well, if we make gamma bigger, that increases the loss, and loss is always what's killing things around resonance. Now, we haven't talked about, well, what if we have multiple resonances happening? Can we play some games there to reduce loss? And yes, there's other things that can happen, but for a single resonance, the only freedom we have to increase the bandwidth is to increase the loss, which of course then ruins things if we don't want the loss. What about far above resonance? Well, far above resonance, materials act like a vacuum. And so again, this is why things are transparent to x-rays and why x-rays can see through your body. So acts like a vacuum, refractive index becomes one, the extinction coefficient, absorption coefficient, everything else goes to zero. And it takes a little while to do that above resonance, but it does eventually get to zero. When we're operating below resonance, uh, two things to point out. Uh, one is the, well, the imaginary part of permittivity goes to zero, and that happens pretty quickly below resonance. So below resonance, materials are very low loss, and that's very useful. So we typically, when we use material, want to be using it below its resonances for that reason. The other thing that happens, we get a DC offset. The resonance has contributed a DC offset, and that goes all the way to DC. And we have this nice little equation for calculating that by setting omega equal to zero in the Lorentz oscillator model. And if we had multiple resonances, well, we would they would each contribute an offset and they would all add. And that gives us some hints about how we can get materials with a higher refractive and extra higher permittivity. We want lots of resonances so that they can all contribute their offsets. What about anomalous permittivity? Notice what happens on resonance and just above it. Our permittivity becomes negative and becomes less than one. And that leads to some interesting things that we'll get into in later lectures. We can talk about also the refractive index. Above, re above the resonance, the refractive index becomes less than one. And we have to think about what that means. Does that mean that waves are traveling faster than the speed of light at frequencies above resonance? And I won't answer that right now. I'll let you think about that. <laughs> 